let me just thank God for the sessions that have gone ahead of us. Prayers, worship, prophecy. The Lord has been awesome in this place. Tell him thank you. Show your gratitude to him. Express to him that you believe in what he's doing. That you believe in what he's doing. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. To you be all the glory and to you be all the praise. Father in heaven, we say thank you. Thank you for saturating our our atmosphere and our spirit with your presence and with your glory. Thank you for the worship that has gone forth. Thank you, Father, for the prayer that has gone forth. Thank you for the prophecy that has gone forth. Thank you for your power that is going forth. Thank you, Father, for you are doing awesome things in Amazon. We say thank you, Jesus. To you be all the glory. To you be all the praise. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God is awesome and is worthy to be praised. Uh, I want us to take some, just about maybe a, a prayer point or two before we begin. While um, Prophet Paul was taking a session, there were some things that stood out to me significantly because of the word that the Lord had laid in my heart. I initially was going to talk about the pathways of the Asian prophet, and he gave a word concerning that, that when he was in a vision during the prayer session, that uh, he had an encounter with the Lord, and the Lord took him and showed him a doorway and a pathway and said, this is the pathway of the Asian prophets. And that was going to be the subject of my contemplation and exhortation today, but I felt there was a foundation that needed to be laid because earlier today, me and Paul had spoken, and I told him, he asked me some questions, I told him, what is brooding in my heart until I'm able to be able to zero down on it. I don't say that this is what the Lord has said to me yet. Until I'm, and then began to zero down on something else, which I believe is a foundation for this. And that brings me to the second point that I took note of during the prayer session. It says, why do men fall? Why do men fall? So because when they ascend, they forget their consecration. When they ascend, they forget their consecration. I want us to pray two prayers. The first prayer is that the Lord will show us the path that he has called us to walk, that he will open our eyes to see the pathway of the Asian prophets. And I want you to know that the, the, the pathway of the Asian prophets is not just talking about prophets of old, He's talking about the, what shall we call it? Shall I call it Christianity of old? The pathway of the ancient prophet is talking about the path of faith that the patriarchs walked on. That is what he's referring to. And I had so much to, to, to lead us into that. For, but the, the Lord is, is showing us a foundational issue that we need to address. But I want to start with that simple prayer. Lord, open my eyes to see the ancient paths. The Bible says, I do not move the ancient boundary stones set up by our fathers. They are boundary stones. They are pathways. They are cultures and values that has been handed down to us, that has been pioneered by others before us. And the Lord wants us to inherit this thing. It's a heritage for us today. But many of us don't even recognize or know it. Lord Jesus, open our eyes to see. I don't have the full picture. I only have a glimpse. And as we dig into it, they, they, they begin to open up to us. And that's my prayer, Lord. Open my eyes. Open my eyes to see the bigger picture, a bigger picture, a fuller picture of the ancient pathways. Open my eyes to see the ancient pathways in the mighty name of Jesus. Father in heaven, do not allow my eyes to be dim. Do not allow my eyes to be blind. Do not allow a veil to cover me that I may see, that I may see. Open my eyes. Man, Open my eyes, open my eyes, open my spirit, man. Open my senses, enlarge my capacity to receive, to, con to, to conceptualize the things of heaven, to download the, 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 the revelations of heaven. Open my eyes, Jesus. Man, the sense of the Raban.
My message is a very short message, but in, in the introduction, we we'll take the entire hour. Uh, may the Lord grant me the grace to deliver the message after the introduction. Second prayer point, Lord, help me. I, 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 ah, I did a study recently and I discovered something about foundations. And let me use this platform as the opportunity to make a correction. You know, this is where I was trained. If you teach something, you find out it's wrong. You find out the, the truth, you come and correct. There's a scripture that says, if the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? And the next verse says, the Lord is in his temple. And the teaching that I later came up with over the years was that if the foundation is destroyed, the righteous can go back to the temple to the Lord to give him, to rebuild the foundation. And the Lord corrected me. He took me to the book of Hebrews chapter 6, and he showed us the foundation. He says that not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works of faith towards God, and, the, and he mentions the, the six elementary principles. And I said, this we will do if the Lord permits. He now says, for it is impossible for those who have been once enlightened, who have tasted of the heavenly gift of the good word of the Lord, of the power of the age to come, and of the spirit of the gift of the Spirit and the power of the age to come, if they should what fall away, to restore them to that foundation of repentance. It's in. See, if that foundation is destroyed, he says there's no going back. So when I saw that, I said, wow, so this is, so the scripture meant what he said. We, we, we just made an inference because the next verse says the Lord is in his temple. And that now makes me understand what the Bible means when it says, if you are unfaithful, he will remain faithful because he cannot deny himself. So if your foundation is destroyed, the Lord is still in his temple, he still remains faithful. It's up to you to know what you want to do with your foundation. I want us to pray that God is not going to only help us build our foundations, but our foundations will not be destroyed. He will not only give us our consecration, but we will not abandon our consecration in the mighty name of Jesus. Father in heaven, this is my humble prayer. I have nothing to offer. I have nothing to stand on but that which you give. He says that we give from that which you have given to us. Please, Lord Jesus, secure my foundation for me. Help me, Lord Jesus, to stand on the solid ground of your foundations. Help me to stand on the foundation which Christ has laid. He says there is no other foundation which any man can lay except that which Christ has laid. And he said this foundation has a seal on it. It has a seal. He has a, an identity marker on it. Say, he that calls upon the name of the Lord, let him depart from wickedness. In the name of Jesus Christ, I, hope, I lay hold on that foundation. Give me a foundation that is solid. Give me a foundation that is solid. Give me a foundation that is solid. Help me not to abandon the foundation. Help me not to abandon my concentration. Help me to be faithful in my concentration in the mighty name of Jesus. It's the name of Jesus. We press in, but deeper and more solid, more formidable foundation in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can I surprise you that the early church, if they had Forbes magazine in their days, and they were talking about pastors in their time, Paul's picture would not come upon any of the magazines. If the church had a secular to talk about pastors in their day, the report of Peter would be that Peter was saying, oh, that old timer, only if you could catch up with what is happening right now. And Paul, we don't know where this one came from, trying to stick close to the apostles. That would have been the report. It is faith and scripture that has brought their legacy to us. They were not famous. They were infamous. They were scum of the earth. They were not celebrity pastors. They were not known. I'm telling you this because if you think maybe ascension is always going to be glamorous. Yes, they pay the price. There so many things that they suffer that we are not going to suffer. Not because persecution is not going to be in our day as it was in times past, but because there was a foundation God was laying 
through them. But that's not my message. Let me not go into that. I just want to tell you that I want you to set your eyes on the substance of the spirit and not on the shaft and shadows that surround it so that you don't lose the treasure hidden in earthen vessels. Hallelujah. Amen. The Lord hear our prayers in Jesus' name. Okay. So, can anybody follow as I begin to share some of the things? So, I want us to look at Second Chronicles. We're going to take like three to four chapters. We'll just um, breeze through them and take some important lessons from them. We're not going to read so many scriptures. In fact, I will just tell you the story as we go. But you can open the scriptures and look at them so you can confirm the stories as I'm reading them. From verse 1 to 3 of um, Second Chronicles chapter 21, we read the story of a king called Jehoram. Now, Jehoram, if memory serves me right, happens to be the son of King Jehoshaphat. And this king, he became king by tradition. When Jehoshaphat was dying, he put the firstborn, Jehoram, to become king. He appointed him to become king in his stead. But the remaining brothers of Jehoram, he gave treasures. The Bible says he gave them articles of values. Gold, silver, precious stones. But those were code names for values of the kingdom. He gave them righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Why he gave his son the kingdom by tradition. So this man rose to become king by tradition. By the time he became king, from verse 4, the Bible says he killed all his brothers who were, in his own eyes, a rival or competition to the throne. And he went and killed the remaining princes in the city, in the nation. So it was a cousin, a relative, whatever the person was, 10th link to the throne, 40th link, 30th link to the throne. I don't know if you ever watched the movie, Designated Survivor. Now, according to that series, the principle of the whole story was that in America, they have a chain of command. If the president dies, who is to take over as the vice president? The vice president dies, who to take over, you know? And they had this long chain of command that it got to the point that somebody set the entire American government up and blew up the entire uh, Congress, including the president and vice president present. But there was somebody who was fired, and his, his termination letter was to be effected the next day. So he didn't show up for that Congress meeting. And so he was a survivor and became a designated survivor. So he now became next in line to become president. There is that long list that people have to say who will be king after them. If their son does not become, does not survive them to become king, maybe his brother, maybe his cousin, maybe his third cousin, maybe his nephew, maybe his this. So there's that chain. And this man wiped everybody that was next in line. Verse 5 to 6 tells us that although he was king of Judah, and this is king of Judah, these are the people who came down from the lineage of King David. The Bible says he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. He followed the men like Ahab and Co. To, to do evil. The Bible says not only did he walk in the ways of the king of Israel, the Bible says he, he, he did things like King Ahab. So Ahab was his role model. You remember when you read the scripture, you see somebody's story and they'll say, and he walked in the ways of his father David. This one walked in the ways of Somebody that was not even his father. Somebody that was not even in his lineage. He walked in the ways of this man called King Ahab. To worsen things, he also married Ahab's daughter, Ataliah, who happens to be the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. This was the kind of man he was. As he married her, the Bible says he did evil in the sight of God. This was God's own verdict. He did evil in the sight of God. You know, sometimes maybe somebody is doing something strange. You don't know whether this is from the Lord or from the devil. And the Bible is telling us clearly, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. From verse 10, the Bible tells us that the nations that were under his dominion previously, they began to rebel. And the Bible spells it out why they rebelled. The Bible says, because King Jehoram had forsaken his God. 
So it was clear this man had forsaken God. From the beginning of his reign, he just forsook God. He just kept doing evil, killed his brothers, killed his cousins, killed every man who was in line for the throne, followed the ways of, of, of pagan kings of, of Israel, married and Jezebel's daughter, you know, marrying those people who had evil reputation. And then now, signs of his forsaking God began to ripple and tear apart his kingdom. From verse 11, we see that he made high places, altars to idols in high places. And then the Bible adds, not only did he do this for himself, he now began to what, mislead the entire congregation of Israel. The citizens began to worship idols also. Verse 12 says, a letter came from Elijah. And for those of you who may not know, Elijah was already translated to heaven at this time. But a letter came from him, and that's a big, beautiful prophetic story for another day. But a letter came from somebody who had departed the earth, and it contains judgment for Jehoram. Now, Jehoram's judgment was very clearly spelled out. The Bible says that the foreigners, like the Philistines, the Arabians, will come. Not the kingdoms who will come against him were not mentioned, but the Bible does that the nations will come against him. He will face what wars, and his family, children, wife, and children will be, will be taken into captivity. They will plunder his possessions. He will become impoverished overnight. And the Bible says God will now plague him with a sickness by which he will also die. A few verses later from verse 16, we see elder sins begin to happen. The Philistines and the Arabians begin to attack him. They took his children captive. They plundered his possession. And then a painful sickness plagued him and he began to die. This was the end of this man's life. Verse 20 tells us that when he died, interestingly, the people of Israel, they did not mourn for him. They saw him for what he was, a bad leader. They buried him in the tomb, but they did not honor him with a ceremonial burning. There's a ceremonial burning they used to put for kings. They didn't do this for him. Then we go so the next king that followed, chapter 22, Second Chronicles, chapter 22. There was a king called Ahaziah, the son of the king, but also he's reading about the whole realm. So we see Jehoram, now King Ahaziah. King Ahaziah is therefore son of Jehoram, Jehoram son of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was a great king, but these people didn't learn anything from him. Why? It seems very obvious. Jehoram rose to power by tradition. Ahaziah rose to power by tragedy. It was because the Arabs and the Philistines that have killed people in the land also killed his uncles, his brothers, everybody. So the people who survived Jehoram's slaughter were killed by the Arabs and the Philistines. So all his sons that could have become king all of them died. Then Ahaziah became king. Ahaziah was not the firstborn. The elder sons, they were all killed in those raids by the Arabs. The Bible now says in verse 2 that he reigned just one year. Now, during this one year of his reign, his mother, Ataliah, daughter of Jezebel, began to guide him and instruct him on how to rule wickedly. The Bible says she taught him to rule wickedly. And he followed her advice. No wonder he died very quickly. Now, upon his death, Ataliah became bitter. So, a puppet is dead. And since she was powerful enough as a queen mother, she began to kill her own sons, her own grandchildren. She killed her son's grandchildren, uh, her son's sons, which are her grandchildren, eliminating everybody who will become heir to the throne so that she can now become queen. For those of you who do not know, there was a queen in Israel for a time, and it was Ataliah, this evil woman, daughter of Jezebel. And she ruled for about six years, six, seven years like that. During this time, there was a priest named Jehoiada. Did I get that name correct? Jehoiada. He now became the protector of the last grandson of Ataliah. His name was Joash. He kept this child for six years. Why? From when he was a baby boy, kept him for six years to protect him. And in the seventh year, he began to trained him to become king. They set up a coup and deposed Ataliah. I know you're wondering where am I going with this. I've been telling you stories, chapter, chapter, chapter. The Bible tells us that this high priest 
was a generous man. He had no interest for power. He was interested in the purposes of God. So he became priest, protected this child, and when the child was ripe enough to bring him to the open and to release it to the people, that people would know that he survived, he came. So this guy rose to become king by intervention of the high priest. His predecessor rose to become king by tragedy. The one before that one became king by tradition, but this one came, he became king by intervention. God intervened, brought a high priest who was a God-fearing man, who was concerned about the purity of the kingdom, and they made him king. Verse 3 of chapter 23 tells us that the people made a covenant with the king. This is not a people who were forced to become king. These were people who loved the king enough to even make a covenant with him that we will serve you. You'll be our king. We were willing. Other people became king without covenant, even though they were good kings. This one became king by covenant. The Bible says the Lord that the, the priests, when they were making him king, they said that this is what God has said concerning the sons of David. So they remembered prophecy. So he rose by intervention, by covenant, by prophecy. Now, by, by verse 16, the Bible now tells you that this king himself is now coming of age. He now begins to make a covenant to serve the Lord. So there was a reformation and destruction of the priests and the altars of the high places in verse 17. In verse 18, they became the reopening of the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord was closed because the two generations before him, they worshipped idols, they worshipped Baal, they did sacrifices to all kinds of evil spirits in high places, they have forsaken the Lord, they followed the advice and the model of Ahab and Jezebel, so these were the kind of people who had been king and leaders in the country before this one rose to power. So the temple had been shut down. The temple was reopened. In chapter 24, the king was already of age and the kingdom was now officially handed over to him. And he began to do more. He began to rebuild the temple. The temple had broken down. So many things were dilapidated. He began to inspire the people. And he followed the guidance of his adoptive father, the high priest, Jehoiada. And that is how he found a model to follow, the same way his father followed the advice and model of Ataliah, daughter of Jezebel. He followed the advice of a king, of a priest, a holy priest. Verse 3 to 14, he begins the repair of the temple, and he told the people to get in resources from the people, and the people willingly gave to the extent that on a daily basis, the treasure chest that used to take weeks or months to fill was being filled on a daily basis. They would go take it to the temple, empty it, take it back to the city gates, and before evening, it's already filled again, and they would take it back. There was zeal for the house of the Lord. There was passion to serve the Lord. There was, people were inspired, people were motivated. This was the kind of leadership that Joash brought from age seven to his old age. He was doing so much great and mighty things. The people gave generously. Verse 15 is where I hope my introduction will end and my message will be able to kick in. I'll just share a few words here. From verse 15, 2 Chronicles 24, verse 15, the Bible tells us this, that Jehoiada grew old and was full of days, and he died. He was 130 years old when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings. He was a priest buried amongst the kings because he had done good in Israel, both towards God and his house. He had done good in Israel, both towards God and his house. He did a wonderful thing. And the Lord was pleased with this. And so the people buried him even with the kings. Speaking of a royal priesthood, a New Testament pattern. Verse 17, and after the deaths, of Jehoiada, the priests, the leaders of Judah came and bowed down to the king. And the king listened to them. So now he needs, there's a vacuum in his life. His mentor has died. His inspiration, his moral compass has died. And now a new set of leaders come to fill that vacuum. And the Bible says, and the king listened to them. Therefore, they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served wooden images and idols and wrapped 
came upon Judah and Jerusalem because of their trespass. Yet, he sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord, and they testified against them, but they would not listen. So God brought judgment, they did not listen. He brought prophet, they did not listen. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the, the priest. So now God had used punishment, he has used prophets, now he's using a familiar person, a family member, somebody who happens to be the son of his mentor, son of his moral compass. And yet the Spirit of God came upon him, who stood above the people and said to them, Thus says God, why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? So God was saying there was consequence to this. It's not just disobedience to God. It's also affecting you personally. It's also affecting you as a nation. You cannot prosper. Because you have forsaken the Lord, he also has forsaken you. So they conspired against him and at the command of the king, they stoned him with stones in the courts of the house of the Lord. Look at that sad story. This man's father preserved his life from imminent danger, raised him, and entrusted his own birthright of the kingdom back to him. Mentored him through his reign. And now his high repays him by killing the man's son, following the advice of wicked leaders. God spoke to him through punishment he did not hear. God spoke to him through pain he didn't hear. He spoke to him through prophet he didn't hear. Now God is speaking to him through family. True relationship, he still will not hear. Verse 22 now says, Thus, Josiah, the king, did not remember the kindness which Joada, the high, his father, had done to him, but killed his son. And as he died, he said, The Lord look on it and repay. Ah, maybe he would have escaped if this man had not pronounce this word. But he pronounced this word and said, do not look on it and repay. He didn't cause him. He just said, let go. Just do pay, pay back for what you. If you have done good, he'll pay you. If you have done bad, you'll see the recompense. Verse 23. So it happened in the spring of the year that the army of Syria came up against him and they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the leaders of the people from among the people and sent all their spoil to the king of Damascus, for the army of the Syrians came with a small company of men, but the Lord delivered a great army into their hand. Can you imagine? Small army of Syria conquered the great army of Judah. According to the scriptures here, the Bible says they executed judgment against Joash. So their act was, in God's own perspective, instrumental to the execution of his judgment. Verse 25, and when they had withdrawn from him, for they left him severely wounded, his own servants conspired against him because of the blood of the sons of Jehoiada the priest. So you see the same people, or maybe a different group of people, but still his people, they took vengeance for the son of the man who they knew raised them. People don't like to see betrayal. I didn't like that. And the Bible says, because of the blood of the, of the sons of Jehoiada, the priest, they killed him on his bed. So he died and they buried him in the city of David, but they did not bury him in the tombs of the kings. So the priest from Levi was buried in the tomb of the kings of Israel, of Judah, but he himself was a descendant of the kings of Judah and was not buried there. Remember the great things that this man did. This is the emphasis of this, my story. I want you to know, look at the great things he did. Look at how he rose to power. How prophecy, covenant, and intervention came. So the Bible tells us that the servants of King Joash were angry at what he did to the sons of uh, the high priest, and therefore they murdered him on his own bed. 
and they didn't give him the ceremonial honor that kings of Judah should have. They buried with their ancestors and King David and King Solomon. But the priest who was from Levi, who did not have a relationship with Judah or David, was given that privilege to be buried with the kings. But this is not where the story gets interesting for me. The story gets interesting for me when I compare this king and his grandfather, King Jehoram. If you remember King Jehoram's story, can you pinpoint one thing that he did that was good? Just one. The Bible says about King Jehoram, his rise to power was by tradition. He solidified his kingdom by killing his brothers and killing the princes. The Bible says he got married to Ataliah, daughter of Jezebel and daughter of Ahab. He followed the ways of Ahab. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel instead of the kings of Judah, which he is a descendant of. The Bible says that he followed evil counsel. He did evil. The Bible says he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. There was not one thing that this guy did that was good. He was so evil that Elijah from heaven had to send a prophet, send a, a, a prophecy of judgment and a letter to him. That was how evil his word is, his life was. And the prophet that had left the scene had to be reactivated to send judgment. And when he died, he also was not given the ceremonial honor of burning fire. And here is King Joash, who had so many great things, but towards the end of his life, died. He dies a failure, he dies as someone who betrayed his mentor and did disservice to his children and his family. I want you to look at something interesting here, the, the Chronicles of the Kings. First Kings chapter three, first Kings chapter three, from verse 10 to 12. I want us to read these Chronicles here. Please open your Bible to 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 10 to 12. The Bible says here, Solomon's son was Rehoboam. Abijah was his son, and Asa his son. Josaphat his son. So you are seeing this genealogy. This is how we now got Josaphat. And after Josaphat was Joram. So when you see Joram, you don't need anybody to tell you that Joram is Jehoram. That is just, it has two different names. So in some places it's called Je Jehoram, but this is called Jehoram. You can check that in second in Kings, Emma and Kings. So the Bible says his son is what? Joram. The right of Joseph who gave him king, the kingdom by tradition, and the other sons who gave treasures or values. Now Joram's own son was what? Ahaziah. That was the one who was born by Ataliah and canceled by Ataliah and reigned only one year. And his son was Joash, which we just finished talking about. He was a great king, raised by priests, but betrayed the peace, the, 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 the priest's legacy when the priest died. And Amaziah, his son. And after Amaziah, his son was Azariah, his son. And Jotam, his son. That is verse 12. Let's go to the book of Matthew and see how the genealogy of Matthew records it. Matthew chapter 1, verse 8 is sufficient for us. The Bible says in verse 8 of Matthew chapter 1, say, Asa begat Jehoshaphat. We already see that. We already saw that there in First Chronicles that Asa begat who? Jehoshaphat. It now says, Jehoshaphat begat Joram. And we saw that already, that Jehoshaphat begat Joram, who we know is Jehoram. Now he now says, Jehoram or Joram begat Uzzah or Uzziah. Begat who? Uzziah. So he jumped three different names. He jumped Amaziah. He jumped, uh, what's the Dama's name? Jotam. And went all the way to Uzziah. Three different genealogies we are jumped. And you might be wondering why this is happening. I'll tell you why it's happening. Simply because this Joash that we saw, 
this great Joash, who did few evil, much good, was not buried with the kings. And his name does not appear in the genealogy in spite of his legendary works. One little evil is not only But Joram, jo, uh, what's his name? Joram, who is also known as Johoram, that did evil from, from his beginning of his reign to the end of his reign. His name is here. He makes it to the genealogy of Jesus Christ. But Joash, the blessed king, who served God for eight seven, so his old age when he now began to be misled by the elders of Israel. His name is not there. This brings me to simple things about our consecration and our calling. He arose. But when he came to power, his association with Ataliah was severe through the ministry of the priest, Jehoadah. But when Jehoadah died, instead of him to stick to that consecration, because we read the story of another young king like himself, which was King um, Josiah. The Bible says that Josiah's father was one of the worst kings. This king was so bad that the Bible says was worse than Ahab. Ahab was a standard of evil for many generations until Manasseh came. Then when Manasseh came onto power, the Bible says Manasseh surpassed Ahab in evil. And he was a king of Judah. And his son, the son Josiah. And the Bible says Josiah walked in the way of his father, David. So though David was not around, no nobody was there to mend on him, he retraced his steps to find adoption from a patriarch of faith. And said, this is where I will model my life after. So the fact that Jehoiada was dead, the priest who mentored Josiah, Joash, though he was dead, Joash could simply have traced his steps. He was not mature enough to read the books of David, not to read the Psalms of David and get inspiration and find adoption, but he did not. And little by little, they re-engrafted him to his own polluted roots. And Ataliah and Jezebel, and began to walk in their ways again and serve them the, the wooden images. This is why your consecration is important. The ways of the prophets, the ways of the ancient prophet is so sacred that if you cut off from that spiritual lineage, that spiritual covering, that spiritual consecration, automatically you will just find yourself going back the way of partition. You just find yourself going back the way of partition. Look at a man who served the Lord well. Look at how he ended. Though he was considered a king in the genealogy of Chronicles, when he came to the Gospels Chronicles, the, the Gospels genealogy, they removed his name. His name was totally blotted out. You know, when we talk about, like, the reason this thing is heavy on my heart is that just a few days ago, uh, Yesterday, today, and some other days like that. I was just, just stumbling on false prophets. And I was sharing with some of my sons on the faith. And look at this, look at this. Some of the people we called false prophets a long time ago that didn't have any sign of false prophets in them. And people said, oh, you're jealous because of it. Then the signs are coming up one by one. And you hear the heinous things they are saying. One of them said, God ruined his marriage, and God can ruin your marriage too. So you have to be careful. You have to put God in a tight leash with that now. So that doesn't ruin you. All kinds of crazy things. So one of them said God made a mistake. And he kept repeating and saying, yeah, God's biggest mistake. You hear them say these things and people still follow them and call them proper. And this is, so it started from somewhere. You may not see the sign. There's an Ataliah spirit somewhere. They come from David. Some of them come from the lineage of David. But there's a polluted stream coming from Jezebel into them that you don't see, you don't notice it quickly. Because all you don't see, but the king of Judah, he's from the tribe of Judah. He's not of the kings of Israel. He's not of the ones that we know in the Babylon sector. But there's some other stream pouring into them little by little. And if, here is not taking, if the surgical work is not done, that seed of rebellion, it will blossom, it will come out, it will show what is on the head. 
It's only in Matthew. I can also a question of time. Look at the story of King Saul. I like to share King Saul's story as, a, as an example of that. He came by prophecy. He came by Samuel. He came by signs. He came by wonders. He came by miracles. He says that though you went out searching the, the, for the donkeys, missing donkeys, you have found the kingdom. So the Lord has delighted in you to make you captain over his people. And yet, the one moment of weakness, the Bible says, he took the sacrifices that were supposed to be uh, devoted to the Lord and brought it to the temple. What should have been devoted offering, he made it burnt offering. Offering and offering, not to the Lord. He devoted offerings and devoted offerings and burnt offerings and burnt offerings. He took the devoted offerings and made them burnt offerings and the Lord said, this is rebellion and this is witchcraft. But we don't say anything about witchcraft in his life until about chapter 28 or so, from chapter 15 to 28. Years have passed. Towards the end of his reign, he reigned for 40 years. He rebelled around two years or so after he became king. So it's like saying for 38 years, he had a clean slate, no sign of witchcraft. But the Bible says 38 years ago, the sin of witchcraft was already planted in him. It was chapter 28. The Bible does it to make the witch of Kendo and ate the sacrifices of devils. But she slaughtered a bull, fattened calf that he ate. Consulted a medium. The same people he had banished from his kingdom years before. This was the kind of man that he turned out to be because there was a seed planted somewhere. So when the Atalaya seed comes, you don't really recognize it because all you can see is the seed of David. But once that mixture is there, it is not seed yet off. Because some of you have drunk from political and still drinking from political and sometimes. And the Lord is saying there is a concentration in you must control. Sometimes I remember one day. Somebody, I, st I stumbled on the video one day. First time stumbling on this, on this uh, preacher, immediately I heard him. Everything he said was correct. And in fact, what he said was not only correct, it was profound. But I knew it was a false prophet. Correct and profound. And I knew it was a false prophet. And I didn't touch it. I left it yet. Months later, one of my disciples found the video and sent it to me in one of our group chats. I said, look at this powerful video. What do you think about it? And I said, false. <laughs> this, you know, when, when he, you don't know the things of the spirit, you would think, oh, are you sure it's not envious? So somebody else has revelation that you don't have. Or somebody has that you don't have. I was listening to one of my old messages. And I'm like, ah, God, don't let me forget these things. I was relearning things. <laughs> because this prophet, this false prophet, as time went on, he began to show his true color. Different destructive, divisive doctrines began to come out from his mouth. Everybody is waiting to see the fruit. We have seen the seed. And we're telling you, there's a seed of Atalai, there's a seed of Jezebel in this one. Don't let it fester. Don't let it grow. Don't let it germinate. Uproot it now. Uproot it now. You want to walk on the ways of the ancient prophets. You want to walk on the pure paths of life. You want to walk on that sacred path of truth. Can I surprise you more? Go and check the scriptures. Bilam, when he was prophesying, he prophesied about the star of Jesus. So I see him. Not me. I see him. With eyes open, seeing the visions of God. He began to prophesy. That prophecy was unique to Bela. It was true. It came to pass. It was even from the Lord. The Lord gave him the visions. But the Bible records that Bela was a sorcerer and the Lord killed him. New Testament calls him the mad prophet. Old Testament calls him the sorcerer. He was not recognized in the annals of heaven amongst the prophets. But today, when you tell somebody that somebody is false about that prophecy he brings, nobody brings that dimension. No other prophet saw the star of, the, of, of Jesus. No other prophet. He was the only one who gave the prophecy of the star. He was unique. 
He was special. He sees the vision of God with his eyes open. That statement was unique to him. Almost like saying nobody saw vision of God like that. And yet, he was a person of God. So don't be moved by spectaculars. Oh, this guy is up. I know the prophet or another one is one of the spectacular prophets. I remember when he began to deviate, Paul had seen three visions he had not shared with me. So one day I just whispered to him that this guy is moving that way. See, ah, he thought he was seeing wrong and he now shared his vision with me. I said, why did you tell me this? I said, I, I see the handwriting on the wall. I may not see it in the vision, but I see the handwriting always very clear to me. And I see that and I said, this guy is deviating. I know the time for intercession for him, and the time came when the Lord said, intercession time is over, and he has crossed the Lord to redemption. We're not here to feed you for some of the people like to send me a message, who is the first prophet. If you don't know the Lord, I can tell you today, this one is the first prophet, and you leave him. But because you did not know the training of the Spirit, you can't attack yourself to the first prophet. Because most times, what attracts you to a first prophet is a whole seed inside of you. That's what you need to deal with. If not, you leave one first prophet, now. I know somebody like that. Every time I have to deliver this lady from one false prophet to one to another. Oh, I see. I can, if I think of, of my head now, there's so many of them that she has been attached to. Separate kind of false prophet until I have to say, okay, enough is enough. I love you. Your time is all this way. Look at the story of these two people. King Jehoram and King Joash. One was an epitome of evil. His name still found its way to the delivery of Christ. He was a failed project, but he was still God's project. But here was a man who was in near success, but he wasn't God's project. What foundation are you building on? This is the time to go back to that foundation now to find out what foundation are you building on? Which are the voices that you're listening to? What are the spirits that are allowing to influence you? I don't want to talk too much about this. I just want to leave it here. Names of people were blotted out of the genealogy, and I made, I took this special one. I took these two because it's easy for you to say, oh, because he sinned, because he did this. What crime did Joash commit that Jehoram did not commit and much more? Jehoram abandoned the temple, never thought this one built temple, repaired temple, sponsored temple. He did great things for the house of the Lord and for the people of God. He never made it into the genealogy of Christ. His father, Azariah, uh, uh, Isaiah, and his son, three of them didn't make it. It was his grandson that now made it. This is a portion of the teaching for the Kingdom series for next year. I'm going to consult Kingdom series again by the grace of God. I just Tell them this one had to be de delivered now to explain to you that foundations matter. I'll just point out certain things you must note about foundations. Number one, foundations have to do with the kind of leadership you are under, the kind of voices that speak into your life. They constitute foundation. You know, one characteristic of foundation is what makes you stand. Careful what spirit, what voices are speaking to your life. Number two, characteristic of a foundation, important uh, aspect of a foundation that I'm speaking to us is consecration. There are certain consecrations you must have. For your art, his consecration was the priesthood, his relationship with the priesthood. With that family that's saved him. That was the, because consecration has to do with your maintain, what maintains you in power. So, and the principle of God is if you don't know what maintains you in power, find out what to put power. 
Because God's principle is, is he maintains a thing the way he starts a thing. He starts a thing the way he intends to maintain the thing. The church was started by apostles. God intends to maintain the church with apostles. He didn't bring the apostles to start the church and he threw them away. And the church will now run without apostles. No. So Jehovah, your, your ash, rose to power by the intervention of the priesthood. The only way he could have stayed in power was relationship to the priesthood. So when the high priest died, the next thing he should have done was relate with the son of the high priest. And in fact, it was the son of the high priest that God used to speak to him finally before he had not fully. He did not hear the voice of rebuke. He did not hear the voice of the prophets. Rather, he did hear the voice of his persecution, the voice of the son of the high priest speaking to him. He said, Lord, he would rather hear the voice of the elders who will lead him to a religion of pleasure instead of a relationship formed by sacrifice. So what is your consecration? These are foundational things. Foundational things, consecration. If you lose these things, the foundation is destroyed. So when the time of judgment comes, there's nothing you can do to escape it. Nothing. The foundation spirit is strong, strong and righteous. The answer is not. Just don't let your foundation be destroyed. I'm not saying you don't go through pro the process of pain or tragedy or disaster, but not the type that destroys foundation. And lastly, about foundation that I will share today is that relationship with Jesus Christ. It is the core, the most important core. When you have lost touch with every other thing, forgotten every other thing, you will need that foundation of Jesus. He will help you stay. I will pray. Lord, take me back to the foundation. Take me back to the foundation. Oh, if I have strayed, take me back to the foundation. Before it is destroyed, before the enemy capitalizes on it, take me back to the foundation. Take me back, you take me back to that foundation stone, Lord Jesus. Take me oh. back. Take me back to the foundation stone. Take me back to the foundation stone. Take me back. 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 Reseke benusa tapalante. Lord, lead me to that rock. Lord, lead me, help me, Lord. Your kanya nose. Jehovah hides me, hides me under the rock. Go tell my enemies, I am under the rock. Jehovah hides me, hides me under the rock. I am under the rock. The rock is higher than I. Jehovah hides yeah. me. Hides me under the rock. Go tell my enemies. I am under the rock. Jehovah hides me. Hides me under the rock. I want us to pray for discerning spirit, for a discerning spirit, discerning spirit. Because the Bible says that the devil, he pretends as an angel of light. He pretends as an angel of light. I want us to pray that the Lord Jesus would open our eyes to see. That many of us who are, we are facing all kinds of error. We are facing all kinds of error because they can't see. Oh, Jesus. Please open our eyes to see. Open our eyes to see. Open our ears to hear. Give us a designing spirit. Give us a designing spirit. Give us a designing spirit. 
He was a designing spirit. The Bible tells us about the young prophets. He was sent on a mission. When he had finished his mission, the Lord said to him, do not go back the way you came. Do not take a rest in the city. Go forward for the next assignment. Then a prophet came. The Bible says he was actually a prophet. But this one had forsaken the Lord. This prophet was insecure. This prophet was jealous. An old prophet came and said an angel had appeared to him and told him to follow him to his house to eat. Though the Lord had told him not to, he followed. He could not discern that this was not from the Lord. Lord Jesus, open our eyes to see. Some people will come and they will say, the Lord has sent them. How can we tell? Some of them will come with a sign and a wonder, like Balaam came with a sign and wonder. Sometimes the sign is and the power that they demonstrate is from the Lord. Balaam spoke by the Lord. It was not a foul spirit that spoke to Balaam. Did not make him a true prophet. <laughs> Lord Jesus, set me free. 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 From blindness, from ignorance, from deceptive spirit, from deceptive messengers, people in, in the employment and in the recruitment of Satan. Deliver me. Deliver me. Deliver me, Lord Jesus, I pray thee. Deliver me. Deliver me, I pray thee, Lord Jesus. Masaka Minonde Banade. Set my eyes on the path of the cross. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want us to pray for that purity. That preservation power of the Holy Spirit to preserve us, to keep us pure. To keep me true, Lord Jesus, keep me true. Keep true. me true, Lord Jesus, keep mm -hmm. me true. Mm -hmm. There is a way I must walk. Straight to me, give me power keep me true lord jesus keep me true lord jesus keep keep me true lord jesus Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Beloved son in the faith, a man of God, for the privilege and the honor. Do not take it for granted. Lord bless you. Lord bless your house. Lord bless the assignment he has given to your hand. I mean, the Lord cause a reward to come upon you that will make you testify so Amen. that you will not have to cry or regret answering the call. Amen. That your testimony will become an inspiration for others in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless you. Amen.